<clears throat> Hello, could somebody please confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, today is May 16th, and we are going to be covering, scroll it down a little, chapter 8 today. I do recognize that there's a quiz this week, it's quiz number 4, and uh, let me share my screen. Uh, quiz number four is going to cover lab seven and chapters five and six. So all of chapter eight will not be on this quiz. Any questions about what we're doing? Did we start chapter eight last time? Anyone recall? Yeah, we did. All right. Not very far. We talked about the uh, uh, first three slides of this chapter. So we talked about what genetics is and what a gene is. Any questions about anything? All right. <clears throat> so let's go through some terminology. A genome is all of the genetic material in a cell. Since we're studying a microorganism, and most of them are, actually almost all of them are, are an individual cell, you can also say a genome is all the genetic material in a microbe. Uh, <clears throat> the study of genomes is called genomics. When we're talking about the genes, we can call one aspect a genotype and the other a phenotype. The genotype is the genes of an organism. For example, someone who has blue eyes has the genotype lowercase b, lowercase b, and someone who has brown eyes or brownish eyes has the genotype capital B, lower b, or there can be two capital Bs. The expression of the genes is called the phenotype, and so the individual who has the genotype lowercase b, lowercase b, will have blue eyes. And then someone who has brown eyes, that is the phenotype, the expression of the genes. Any question about any of those? Are you hearing something in the background? My uh, roommate has uh, the television on kind of loud. Are you guys able to hear that? No. Great. All right, uh, here we're looking at the chromosome out of an E. coli, and it's just a string of DNA with proteins in it. Uh, eukaryotes have the protein histone, which the DNA actually wraps around the protein, but uh, uh, prokaryotes do not have that histone protein. They have other proteins, but not histone. And the genes are just one region of the chromosome encoding for something. The DNA, as you recall, is a polymer of nucleotides. There are four different nucleotides in DNA, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And you can learn those names, or you can call them A, T, C, and G. Either way is fine. DNA is a double helix, meaning it's two strands of DNA together. It is associated with proteins. It is the uh, deoxyribose, meaning the sugar, and the phosphate, which is the backbone of the DNA, holding the DNA together. You have my mouse move, there it goes. Uh, the nucleotides are off on the steps, and they do not hold the DNA 
at least one single strand of DNA. The nucleotides don't hold one single strand of DNA together. The uh, sugar phosphates hold the DNA together. The nucleotides are on the steps and they hydrogen bond to the other strand of DNA. And the only hydrogen bond with A, hydrogen bonding with T, and obviously T with A, and then C, hydrogen bonding with G. And that's how they pair, meaning a C will not pair with an A or a T because they don't hydrogen bond to each other. The two strands of DNA are anti-parallel, meaning one strand is running this way and the other strand is running that way. I don't know if you can see that. I guess maybe that way would be better. So the two strands of DNA are running in opposite directions. You can say that one strand has a five prime end over here, and then the three prime end over there. The other strand has a three prime end over here, the five prime end over here. These numbers refer to the carbon position in the sugar. So this would be the three prime carbon, and right there is the five prime carbon. Five, number five carbon in the sugar. Any question about any of that? All right, the vertical flow of information within a cell starts with the DNA. The DNA encodes the information in the DNA, in the genes. And then that information flows to RNA by transcription and then uh, flows to protein by uh, translation. And this is the flow of information within a cell. The information starts in DNA, flows to RNA, flows to protein. They each have their own language. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, let me go on with that. And that is the DNA encodes the information in the language of nucleotides. There are four different nucleotides or four different letters in the DNA. And the information in the RNA is also stored in nucleotides. And there's four different letters or four different nucleotides in RNA. And then the information is translated into amino acids. And so that would be the language for protein. And there's 20 different letters in the protein, meaning at least in humans, we have 20 different amino acids. Most organisms also have uh, 20 different amino acids in the organism. For comparison, English, another language, has 26 letters in the English language meaning 26 different uh, characters of the alphabet. Any questions about any of that? Uh, when we're saying the information is encoded in the nucleotides of DNA, you can say something like, that is a dog, that information is encoded in the DNA. In RNA, it is similar, but slightly different, like a different dialect. And you could say it's translated into, that is a dog. And then in the protein, the information would be uh, the same information, but in a totally different language. And it would be something like, coelho e un cane. Okay. Any questions about the vertical flow of information within the cell? Now, the information in organisms does flow in more than one way. There's the information flowing within a cell that we've already talked about. There's also the information flowing between generations of cells. And that would be from the information in the DNA flowing to the information when the cell divides into the daughter cells. The DNA has to be copied. And then the information flows to each of the daughter cells. For humans, you'd have the information in two parents flows into the information in one offspring. And that also is the flow of information between generations of cells. We also have the flow of genetic information between cells of the same generation. 
And you notice I've changed the figure that they give you in the book because I think this is a little not clear when they're going from the DNA from the parent cell flows by recombination into the DNA of the recombinant cell. In reality, that DNA in the parent cell leaves the DNA and then it's outside the cell and then flows into the recombinant cell, which takes in the uh, the DNA. And then this cell gains DNA from another cell, and that DNA gained the DNA from this cell. This cell usually dies, by the way, when it loses its DNA. All right, any question about the flow of information within a cell, between generations of cells, or between cells of the same generation? We talked about the flow of information within a cell. Let's talk about the flow of information between generations of cells. And this is called the vertical flow because DNA moves from uh, the top cell to the bottom two cells or the generations of cells. That happens when the DNA replicates. Let me blow this slide up. so you can see it better. What happens is the DNA in the double strand separates into a single strand, and then each strand is used as a template to make a new strand of DNA. And what happens is the polymerase reads the nucleotide over here, and then it inserts the correct nucleotide over here, and since that's a T, then the uh, DNA polymerase knows to insert an A here. Come on, mouse. my mouse died. There it is. And then it moves down to the next nucleotide, sees a G here, and it'll insert a C here. Moves down again, seeing a C, and then it knows to insert a G. And we say that uh, this strand is being used as a template to make the new strand of DNA. And that happens on both strands of the DNA. Any question about any of that? Now, this replication of DNA is said to be semi-conservative. Semi-conservative means that when they have the two original strands shown in black, the new strand of DNA will have one of the original old strand of DNA, and then one strand that is a new strand of DNA. And that's true for both of the newly replicated daughter cells. That's different than the, uh, uh, let me go back, than the conservative model, which would have had uh, one of the daughter cells having both strands of the old black DNA, and then the other strand would have two white new strands of DNA. That's the conservative model. DNA replication follows the semi-conservative model of DNA replication, where the newly made daughter cell has one strand of the original DNA and one strand of new DNA. Any question about any of that? And how that happens is, like I said, the DNA polymerase just reads the strand of DNA, the A here, and then it inserts the T. How that exactly happens is that a, T is a triphosphate. The nucleotide, uh, the polymerase brings in the nucleotide, and then it cuts off the two phosphates, and that releases a lot of energy, which gives the cell the energy it needs to um, add the T onto the growing strand of DNA, meaning when you add a nucleotide to a growing strand of nucleotides, that takes energy. And how that energy comes about is, is that the energy is supplied when the two phosphates are released from the nucleotide. And that's how we get the double strand of DNA. Any question about that?
All right, let's watch a little video on DNA replication. DNA is a molecule made up of two strands, twisted around each other in a double helix shape. Each strand is made up of a sequence of four chemical bases, represented by the letters A, C, G and T. The two strands are complementary. This means that wherever there's a T in one strand, there will be an A in the opposite strand. And wherever there's a C, there will be a G in the other strand. Each strand has a five prime end and a three prime end. The two strands run in opposite directions. This determines how each strand of DNA is replicated. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands. This unzipping is done by an enzyme called helicase and results in the formation of a replication fork. The separated strands each provide a template for creating a new strand of DNA. An enzyme called primase starts the process. This enzyme makes a small piece of RNA called a primer. This marks the starting point for the construction of the new strand of DNA. An enzyme called DNA polymerase binds to the primer and will make the new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add DNA bases in one direction, from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end. One of the new strands of DNA, the leading strand, is made continuously the DNA polymerase adding bases one by one in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The other strand, the lagging strand, cannot be made in this continuous way because it runs in the opposite direction. The DNA polymerase can therefore only make this strand in a series of small chunks called Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is started with an RNA primer. DNA polymerase then adds a short row of DNA bases in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The next primer is then added further down the lagging strand. Another Okazaki fragment is then made and the process is repeated again. Once the new DNA has been made, the enzyme exonuclease removes all the RNA primers from both strands of DNA. Another DNA polymerase enzyme then fills in the gaps that are left behind with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase seals up the fragments of DNA in both strands to form a continuous double strand. DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because each DNA molecule is made up of one old, conserved strand of DNA and one new one. Okay, any questions about that video? Let's go through that in a little more detail. So DNA is copied by DNA polymerase, and the DNA is made in the five to three prime direction. It is initiated by an RNA primer, meaning you put in an RNA, piece of RNA first, but then that's removed and it's filled in eventually with DNA. The leading strand is synthesized continuously because it's running in the correct direction. And so the DNA polymerase can just run down the DNA in the five to three prime direction, adding the uh, correct nucleotides. The lagging strand, on the other hand, is not made continuously because the DNA cannot move down the strand this way. It has to, let me blow this up a little. I'm not seeing, oh, there it is. Side, there we go. 
uh, the DNA cannot move down this way. It has to move this way. And so a DNA polymerase binds to the DNA here, and then it makes a small stretch of DNA on the new strand running this way, which is opposite to the way the helicase is moving that way. And these stretches of DNA that are made on this strand called the lagging strand are called Akazaki fragments after the the uh, Japanese doctor who discovered it. <clears throat> and so we say on this strand that the DNA is not made continuously. It's made discontinuously in small stretches. And uh, this strand of DNA is replicated a little differently than that strand. Uh, for one thing, uh, wherever there is a stretch of DNA, and then the DNA polymerase comes on, uh, there will be a gap here that the last nucleotide will not be bound to this nucleotide. And then the same with this stretch here. It'll put a DNA polymerase here, but it doesn't connect that polymerase to, I mean, this stretch of DNA to that stretch of DNA. How that is filled in, meaning the DNA is eventually made into a single strand, is the ligase comes on and it will... Um, connect each of these pieces of DNA to the piece of DNA in front of it. And so a ligase will connect that one in right here. And so the ligase has to work uh, an awful lot on the lagging strand. Wherever you have an Akazaki fragment, you're going to have to connect the, I guess, the back end, the last end, to the other strand of DNA. And then you have to connect the uh, where this Akazaki fragment started to the other strand of DNA. Whereas on this strand, the ligase really only has to work in two places because this DNA is made sequentially. Let's say it started right here. Well, the ligase would have to bind this strand right here to that strand. And then if this ligase were to come off right here, and then another ligase, uh, excuse me, DNA polymerase were to start the strand again here, the ligase would have to work there. So on a perfect day, the, the DNA never falls off the, the chromosome and the DNA polymerase copies the entire leading strand. Then the ligase never has to work on the, uh, on the uh, leading strand. However, usually a DNA polymerase will not start at the beginning of the chromosome. There will be a spot that will be started already. And then the DNA polymerase will bind and start there and then continue. So usually, and then the DNA polymerase may not finish the chromosome. It may fall off and another DNA polymerase will come on. So usually there are a few <clears throat> places on the leading strand the ligase does have to connect. So the important enzymes to uh, replicate the DNA is the helicase, which opens up the double strand of DNA and makes it single strand. You can only replicate single stranded DNA, not double stranded DNA. And so the helicase is essential. And then the DNA polymerase is essential because it's what makes the new strand of DNA, putting on the correct nucleotide from the the uh, original old strand of DNA, using it as a template. And then the third enzyme, which is really important, is the DNA ligase. And it links the, the single strand of DNA together so that it's one single strand of DNA. There are a few other enzymes, but we're not going to go into any detail about them, so you don't need to know them. And the movie did tell you about the RNA primase, it puts on the short stretch of RNA. Like I said, you don't really need to know that because that short stretch of RNA uh, starts the DNA off and then it uh, will be removed and will be filled in with DNA. All right, any questions about DNA replication?
I think I mentioned this. Yep, I mentioned all of that. All right. So that's DNA replication. Let's move on to DNA transcription. DNA transcription is the, we should call RNA transcription, is the making of RNA from DNA. DNA is transcribed to make RNA, and there's three different types of RNA, messenger RNA, tRNA, and rRNA. Here's a question I always ask my students, and almost never do they get it right. Uh, when the DNA is being transcribed into RNA, how does the cell know which RNA to make? Like if the uh, RNA polymerase is on the DNA and it's making RNA, how does that RNA polymerase know to make messenger RNA, tRNA, or rRNA? Anyone know? Anyone have a guess? Nobody's going to take a guess? It's actually very simple, and that is the cell simply looks at what gene it is transcribing. If the gene is a gene that codes for protein, then the RNA polymerase makes messenger RNA. If, on the other hand, the gene is a gene that codes for tRNA, then the RNA polymerase encodes tRNA. And if the gene codes for rRNA, then the RNA polymerase makes rRNA. The only difference between rRNA, tRNA, and messenger RNA is the sequence of the nucleotides in the RNA. Any question about any of that? How does it know which one to make more of? Um, what the uh, RNA polymerase does, it just binds to the DNA. And depending on what that gene is, it will transcribe the correct RNA. Okay, because all it does is it reads the DNA, the sequence, the sequence of the nucleotides, and then it adds an RNA nucleotides, and uh, it will make rRNA, tRNA, or messenger RNA depending on the sequence of the nucleotides in the gene. Uh, now, the question about how does the cell know to make more of one than the other? Well, it depends, like I said, what uh, gene it's transcribing. In the cell, most of the genes code for messenger RNA because most of the genes will code for a protein, but there are a handful that code for tRNA and another handful that code for rRNA. But in the cell, there is more rRNA than any other type of RNA. And that's because the rRNA is in the ribosome and there's an awful lot of ribosomes in a cell. And that's why there's so much rRNA in a cell. So most of the rRNA, excuse me, most of the RNA in a cell is actually ribosomal RNA. But most of the genes code for messenger RNA. So does that answer your question? Yes, no. but what I was wondering, like, what about to turn it, to turn something off to control growth? Uh, you lost me. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Well, like to turn to turn some genes off and to turn them on. Um, it doesn't matter because the gene will code for either rRNA, tRNA, or messenger RNA, and so if you turn it on or off, you're just turning that gene off or on. Okay. Okay. All right. So how a transcription begins is the RNA polymerase binds to a region of the DNA, and the region of DNA is called the promoter. The promoter, all it does is it's a region of DNA that tells the RNA polymerase bind here. 
So that's what that region of DNA encodes for. It tells the RNA polymerase bind here. We call this the promoter. It is upstream of the gene, and then the RNA polymerase binds there, and it just simply transcribes the DNA after that point, making the RNA. Transcription proceeds in the direction five to three prime, which is the same way that DNA uh, is replicated. So RNA is made in the direction five prime to three prime. And then the RNA polymerase continues transcribing the DNA until the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator. The terminator is a region of DNA after a gene, and the terminator codes for the RNA polymerase to fall off the DNA. And when the RNA polymerase falls off the DNA, it will stop uh, translating the DNA and stop making messenger RNA. Any question about any of that? All right. So only the genes are transcribed. Not all of the DNA is transcribed. So only the region between the promoter and the terminator are transcribed. And I just mentioned the promoter is uh, just a little bit upstream of the gene. And then the terminator is at the end of the gene or, or right after the end of the gene, however you want to word that. And any of the DNA in between the terminator and the promoter is not transcribed. Now in a eukaryote, there is a lot of DNA which does not encode information for a gene and this DNA is never transcribed. We call that non-coding DNA. No, in, in prokaryotes, especially in the bacteria, there's very little region of DNA, which is non-coding uh, non DNA. Meaning in a bacteria, one gene follows another gene. So when one gene ends, the next gene will Begin, meaning as soon as the terminator is there, there's the promoter. Any question about any of that? So the, the point is in a eukaryote, there's a lot of DNA. Most of the DNA is actually non-coding DNA. And there's less coding DNA, which is the DNA that is where the genes are. But in a bacteria, most of the DNA, not all of the DNA, but most of the DNA is coding DNA. Any question about any of that? And the non-coding DNA is never transcribed. It is obviously replicated in DNA replication. All right, this is showing you uh, transcription where the information is being copied from DNA to messenger RNA. And uh, there actually is the RNA polymerase. And you see that right there? That's the strand of RNA being made. And that's the, the DNA there, the big strand or that one there. Uh, let's go into transcription in a little more detail. We have a little video to watch. Oops. Come on. Well, that was weird. The E. coli lac operon is an example of an inducible set of genes. These genes are responsible for the breakdown of lactose into sugars used for cellular metabolism. This inducible system also involves 
bacterial DNA, a repressor, mRNA, and the sugar molecule lactose. This animation will only focus on two of the three proteins encoded by the LAC operon, beta-galactosidase and permease. Gene expression can be induced or turned on when a specific inducer molecule appears in a cell. For inducible systems, a repressor molecule prevents gene expression by binding to the upstream controlling region. Lactose is the LAC operon inducer molecule. After first appearing in the cellular environment, lactose passively enters the E. coli cell and binds to the repressor molecule. This binding releases the repressor from the controlling region. At this point, RNA polymerase can begin transcription of the operon. Here we show two of the three LAC operon genes being transcribed into mRNA. Ribosomes then bind to the mRNA and the two proteins are translated. The first protein is beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into two simple sugars. The second protein is permease, a membrane-bound protein. When embedded in the cell membrane, permease functions to provide a direct route for the lactose outside the cell to be imported into the cell. This import occurs at a much greater rate than the passive transfer we first observed. Because translation continues inside the cell, other permease proteins become embedded in the membrane. This further increases the rate at which lactose enters the cell. Beta-galactosidase breaks the cellular lactose into the simple sugars glucose and galactose. Once its concentration is greatly reduced, the lactose bound to the repressor are released. At this point, the repressor again binds to the controlling region and gene expression is halted. For all inducible systems like the LAC operon, it is the interaction of the repressor and inducer molecules that mediate gene expression. Okay, any questions about that video? I wonder if this is the right video. I'll have to look into that. That was supposed to be RNA transcription. What it did show you. All right, so uh, the important part is, is that transcription begins when the DNA polymerase binds to the promoter, and then it just moves down the DNA, uh, which will um, be transcribed into RNA. So as the RNA polymerase moves down, the RNA will be longer. And then the DNA snaps back. It has to be... Uh, it has to be uh, single-stranded when RNA transcription is occurring, but it's only uh, single-stranded uh, around the region of the RNA polymerase. And then the RNA polymerase moves to the terminator. And once it reaches the terminator, the terminator codes for the RNA polymerase to fall off. When the RNA polymerase falls off the DNA, that will release the uh, transcribed messenger RNA. And then this messenger RNA is ready to go uh, into the cytoplasm and uh, be translated. Now in a eukaryote, this RNA has to leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. In the prokaryotes, this RNA is actually already in the cytoplasm. All right, any question about any of that? So after RNA transcription, we then have protein translation. This is the synthesis of proteins by the ribosomes using the information encoded by the messenger RNA. So of the uh, 
of the RNA, only messenger RNA is translated into protein. The other RNAs are important in the translation process, meaning we use all three types of RNA, messenger RNA, uh, rRNA, and then tRNA in protein translation. But it's the messenger RNA that encodes the information to make the protein. The rRNA is actually in the ribosome, and ribosomes are both rRNA and ribosomal proteins. And then the tRNA brings the correct nucleotide, excuse me, not nucleotide, the correct amino acid in the uh, growing polypeptide that will eventually become the protein. So the tRNAs are what bring the correct amino acid in, and it's actually the tRNA that reads the messenger RNA, and, and you'll see that when I go through it in, in depth. So how the messenger RNA information is encoded is each messenger RNA is translated into a codon, and there are th each codon is a group of three nucleotides. So when the ribosome is moving down the messenger RNA, it will read three of the nucleotides of the messenger RNA as a codon, and then use that codon to translate the messenger RNA into the amino acids of the protein. When the ribosome binds to the messenger RNA, it does not initially translate the messenger RNA into the amino acids of the protein. The ribosome will not begin protein translation until the ribosome has moved down to the start codon, which is AUG. So upstream of AUG on the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is not translated. The ribosome just moves down it and doesn't do anything until it reaches the codon AUG, which is said to be the start codon. AUG actually does two things, and that is it tells the ribosome to start protein translation here, and it also tells the ribosome, add the amino acid methionine. So every polypeptide that gets started in protein translation will start with methionine because AUG codes for methionine. So every protein, when it's initially made, will begin with the amino acid methionine. If that protein does not want to start with the amino acid methionine, it will simply cut off that amino acid. Any question about any of that? And then the uh, ribosome will read the codons one after the other on the messenger RNA, adding the correct amino acids. And it will do that until the ribosome reaches one of the stop codons. Now, you don't need to memorize which of the sequences is a stop codon. There's three of them. The important part is just to know that there's a stop codon. And when the ribosome reaches a stop codon, it tells the ribosome, stop protein translation here. So that means on the messenger RNA, the starting region of the messenger RNA will not be translated because it's before the AUG. And then the ending region of the messenger RNA will not be translated either because it's after one of the stop codons. Any question about any of that? All right, let me blow this slide up. So when we're talking about the codons, I did mention that the 
three nucleotides, which encode a codon, code for an amino acid. So each messenger RNA codon codes for one amino acid. However, organisms typically only have 20 different amino acids. Certainly humans and most other organisms only have 20 different amino acids. But there are a little over 60 possible codons. So if you put all of the three sequence of nucleotides together, and there's four different nucleotides to put in, we have a little over 60 codons. That means that there are either some codons that don't code for anything, and that's not the case, or that uh, some of the codons encode for the same amino acid, and that is the case. There's more than one codon for most of the amino acids, like phenylalanine, UUU is a codon that codes for uh, phenylalanine, but UUC also codes for uh, the amino acid phenylalanine. Most of the amino acids have more than one codon. There's only two that don't, and really you only need to know one of them, and that is methionine, only AUG, is the codon that codes for methionine. There's no other codon that codes for methionine. And the other one is tryptophan. Only UGG codes for the amino acid tryptophan. And I should mention that we're talking about a eukaryotes uh, codons here. Uh, we're doing that just because humans are eukaryotes. Because in bacteria, actually, AUG doesn't code for methionine. I think I mentioned that, and uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, so we're only talking about, really, in the case of humans. Any question about any of that? All right. So there's some amino acids which are encoded. Actually, there's actually two that are encoded by only one um, codon. There's some that are encoded by two codons. Phenylalanine is an example. There's some that are encoded by four codons. Serine is an amino acid that's encoded by four codons. And then there's some that are encoded by six codons. The amino acid leucine uh, has six codons that encode for that amino acid. This is actually known as the uh, redundancy or degeneracy of the uh, genetic code. And that is... There's more than one codon coding for the same amino acid. Any question about any of that? All right, let's watch a little video on protein translation. Translation is the synthesis of a protein from an mRNA template. This process involves several key molecules, including mRNA, the small and large subunits of the ribosome, tRNA, and finally, the release factor. The process is broken into three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. Let's see the process in action. Eukaryotic mRNA, the substrate for translation, has a unique three prime end called the poly A tail. mRNA also contains codons that will encode for specific amino acids. A methylated cap is found at the five prime end. Translation initiation begins when the small subunit of the ribosome attaches to the cap and moves to the translation initiation site. tRNA is another key molecule. 
it contains an anticodon that is complementary to the mRNA codon to which it binds. The first mRNA codon is typically AUG. Attached to the end of the tRNA is the corresponding amino acid. Methionine corresponds to the AUG codon. The large subunit of the ribosome now binds to create the peptidyl, or P-site, and the amino acyl, or A-site. The first tRNA occupies the P-site. The second tRNA enters the A-site and is complementary to the second mRNA codon. The methionine is then transferred to the A-site amino acid, the first tRNA exits, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and the next tRNA enters. These are the basic steps of elongation. As elongation continues, the growing peptide is continually transferred to the A-site tRNA, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and new tRNAs enter. When a stop codon is encountered in the A-site, a release factor enters the A-site and translation is terminated. When termination is reached, the ribosome dissociates and the newly formed protein is released. Okay, any questions about that video? So, uh, going through that in a little more detail, uh, protein translation begins when the ribosome binds the messenger RNA and translates the messenger RNA into protein or amino acids that will eventually become the protein. How that happens is the ribosome binds on the messenger RNA and then we'll move down the messenger RNA, RNA until it reads AUG. Now I'm saying that the ribosome reads AUG, but in a way it's really the tRNA that binds to the messenger RNA and reads the, the uh, messenger RNA. What happens is the tRNA uh, has an anticodon which will bind to and hydrogen bind to the the uh, codon of the messenger RNA. So if the codon is AUG, then the anticodon of the correct tRNA is UAC, and the U will hydrogen bond to the A, the A will hydrogen bond to the U, and the C will hydrogen bond to the G. Now this tRNA fits in a hole in the ribosome. And so the ribosome is holding everything together and will be moving down the messenger RNA. And that will allow the tRNA to come in because the, the ribosome does stabilize the uh, tRNA when it's inside the hole. And then the tRNA can bind to the uh, messenger RNA and then insert the correct amino acid. So this tRNA that has the anticodon UAC has methionine, and that's how the um, messenger RNA codon will be read into the correct amino acid, and that is the uh, codon will bind to the anticodon, and then the correct anticodon will be with the correct tRNA, which will bring in the correct amino acid. Any question about any of that? So here we see the messenger RNA with the ribosome intact. And like I said, it has a channel, I guess better than a hole, a channel in it that the tRNA can come into the ribosome and then bind to the messenger RNA, bringing in the correct amino acid. The ribosome has a second channel. There's actually a third channel, which isn't used. And uh, uh, the correct amino acid will come into the 
second channel, bringing the correct amino acid for the second codon. Remember, the start codon is always AUG, and it will code for the amino acid methionine, as well as tell the ribosome, begin protein translation here. Upstream of that, there's no protein translation occurring on the messenger RNA. Now, uh, the methionine is removed from the tRNA, and it's actually the R RNA portion of the ribosome that does that. And then that methionine is uh, bound to the amino acid on the second tRNA, so that methionine is now linked uh, in a, what do you call that, a uh, covalent bond to the uh, leucine of the second amino acid. And once again, that's the R. RNA of the ribosome that does that. This is the only time where we discussed an enzyme, meaning it's an enzyme that removes the methionine from the first tRNA and then binds it to the amino acid of the second tRNA. And this enzyme is actually a rRNA enzyme. Your book doesn't mention that, but I am. And this is the only time we'll ever talk about an R RNA enzyme. Any questions about any of that? Which the book calls a ribozyme. All right. Once the meth methionine or the amino acid is removed from this tRNA, that tRNA then falls off and out of the ribosome. That will allow the ribosome to then move down the messenger RNA and the um, tRNA that used to be in the second position now will move into the first position in the ribosome. And that will allow the next tRNA to come in uh, this position here of the uh, ribosome. So there you can see the what used to be in the second position over here is moved to the first position. And uh, um, the second tRNA or the third tRNA then comes into the second position of the the second channel of the ribosome, and that brings in the correct amino acid. And then once again, the uh, RNA enzyme of the ribosome removes this amino acid from this tRNA and links it to this amino acid of that tRNA. And that will allow this tRNA to come out, et cetera. And that'll make the ribosome move down once again. Shown here. And then once again, the uh, correct amino acid is brought in. In this case, it's methionine. And you notice AUG isn't acting as a start code on here. It's actually coding for the amino acid methionine. And et cetera the ribosome will move down one more codon, allowing the uh, correct amino acid to come in. And that process will continue until the messenger RNA reaches a stop codon. The stop codon will then tell the ribosome to stop protein translation here. And the ribosome will fall apart, come off the messenger RNA, that will release the growing polypeptide or the growing protein. And that will make then the protein because you're not adding any further amino acids. So it was no longer a growing protein. That's the finished protein. Any question about any of that? And there that's showing you the ribosome actually falls apart. 
the tRNA comes off, the messenger RNA comes off, and then the protein um, comes off. And right there, you'll notice the protein has come off and it's just a sequence of amino, amino acids. So that's a primary structure of the protein. Remember the four different structures? And uh, the protein then starts folding on itself. The nearby amino acids start interacting and that would be a secondary structure. And this looks like it's even starting to form the tertiary structure. All right, any questions about protein translation? If not, let's talk a little bit about some complications. In prokaryotes, uh, well, actually in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, this complication can happen. And it's shown in the first, I don't know, first picture, and that's also a picture, so maybe the second picture. And this is actually a, gene right there, and these right there are, uh, those are uh, messenger RNAs being made on the gene. And right here, you can see this is much longer than that one, and longer than that one, longer than that one, longer than that one, longer than that one, and longer than this first one here. And that's because as the RNA polymerase comes down the gene, it'll add more messenger RNA to make the messenger RNA. And that's why the messenger RNA is so small here and gets bigger as you come down here. Uh, the important part is I'm trying to show you a complication, and that is for each gene being transcribed, you can have more than one RNA polymerase transcribing that gene. In fact, on this one, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different messenger RNA products being transcribed from this one single gene. So that's the first complication. And that complication you can see in both eukaryotes and in prokaryotes, that each gene can have more than one transcript being made from the same gene at the same time. Although this one started first, and then that one, 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 and lastly, that one started. Any question about any of that? And by the way, this is a transmission electron microscopic image of uh, a piece of DNA being transcribed. Now, in prokaryotes, we have a additional complication, and that is transcription occurs in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm is where protein translation occurs. In a eukaryote, we never have this complication because transcription occurs in the nucleus, and protein translation occurs in the cytoplasm. So in eukaryotes, we don't have this complication. But in prokaryotes, we do. And you see the RNA polymerase transcribing the gene. Let me blow this up if I can. The RNA polymerase is this little round thing there. And then the blue line is the RNA being transcribed. And then the uh, red circle there is the ribosome bound to the messenger RNA. And it is translating that messenger RNA into protein, which isn't really shown here, but it's shown there. Uh, that This is a ribosome, each one of these. And you'll notice that messenger RNA has many ribosomes bound to it. And so this one messenger RNA is actually being translated into proteins. And so this one messenger RNA is being translated into one, two, three, four, five different proteins by five different ribosomes. Any question about any of that? And that's happening at the same time. And in prokaryotes, before 
RNA transcription has finished, we have protein translation already beginning. Any question about any of that? So protein translation and RNA transcription can happen the same time in, or close to the same time, in uh, prokaryotes. Any question about any of that? All right. And that is actually shown here that uh, each of these dots is a ribosome. I don't see the uh, protein being made on there, but that's probably because it's, it's like that line there, maybe. Any questions about any of this? All right. That's the complication. That's a really big complication. Uh, in eukaryotes, they don't have this complication where protein translation is occurring at the same time as protein transcription. However, we have another complication in eukaryotes, and that is in eukaryotes, when the messenger RNA is transcribed, the initial messenger RNA will have regions of messenger RNA which code for the protein, and we'll have regions of messenger RNA which do not encode for the protein. In the gene, this region is called an exon because it's a region of the gene that codes for the protein in the messenger RNA. And we have regions of the gene which do not code for the protein. And these we call introns. And initially in that RNA transcription, the introns are transcribed. This early messenger RNA, including the introns, cannot leave the nucleus. The uh, pores in the membrane do not allow a messenger RNA that has introns to leave the nucleus. What happens is the initial messenger RNA is processed and the introns are spliced out. Splice simply means to cut. And then it's spliced together, which means to anneal. The exons are then annealed to each other. And then this final messenger RNA, which only encodes for the information that are encoded in the exons, is allowed to leave the nucleus, meaning the pores and the membrane will allow the finalized messenger RNA, only encoding exons, to leave the nucleus and then enter the cytoplasm. And once in the cytoplasm, it will be translated into protein. Any questions about any of those complications? All right. Obviously, we don't have this complication in prokaryotes because you don't have a nucleus. So in this lesson, we've talked about the structure and function of the genetic material. We talked about the flow of genetic information. We talked about DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. We're about to talk about the regulation of uh, bacterial gene expression. When we're talking about gene expression, we need to talk about an operon. After we talk about the regulation of gene expression, we'll talk about mutations, talk about genetic transfer and recombination. And then lastly, we'll talk about genes and evolution. Just one slide on that topic. Any questions about what we've done and where we're going? All right, let's begin talking a little bit about bacterial gene expression. Uh, bacteria, as well as all cells, need to regulate their genes 
And that regulation we call gene expression, meaning there are different ways to regulate the contents in a cell, but an easy way to regulate the contents in a cell is to control gene expression. If you need the gene to be expressed, then you turn on the gene and you make the message of the gene, meaning the end product of the gene, which for most genes, you make a protein. You don't for a messenger RNA, I mean, a, a tRNA gene or an rRNA gene, you make either tRNA or rRNA for that gene. But most genes code for a protein, so you'll, you'll make a protein. If you don't need the protein, then you can turn off the gene, and then the gene will not be expressed. And if you need the gene, you turn on the gene, and then you make the end product of that gene. Any questions about any of that? And that is called control of gene expression. There are some genes, like the constitutive enzymes, and they're always turned on, and they're expressed or they're uh, transcribed at a fixed rate. Um, you don't need to know an example, but uh, what was that gene called? Uh, obviously, polymerase would be an example. Um, all of the housekeeping genes are genes that are turned on all the time, and they're always expressed at a fixed rate, while we call them housekeeping genes. The cell needs them, and so these genes are always turned on. Hmm, I used to know another example, but you don't need to know examples for that. There are other genes that are not always needed, and they are turned off unless they are needed. So we say these genes are expressed only as they are needed. Some enzymes are expressed only as they are needed. There's two ways that a gene can be turned on and off. There's a repressible gene and there's an inducible gene, such as a repressible enzyme or an inducible enzyme. And that's one way you can control the products in a cell. You regulate the gene expression. There is other regulation. You can regulate by pre-transcriptional control, such as an inducible operon. You have an repressible operon. And we're not going to really talk about a repressible operon. You're not going to be tested on it. I'm not going to cover it. There are another way to regulate by pre-transcriptional control, and that is by epigenetic control. We're not going to talk about it, and you're not going to be tested on it. And it's something that even today, geneticists have a hard time explaining what's going on, where the cell controls the genes by epigenetic control. And... Uh, depending on what environment the cell is in and what the history of the cell is. And a lot of things go into epigenetic control. We're not going to talk about it. And then there's another way you can control the regulate the contents of a cell, and that is by post-transcriptional control. And in a sense, we've already talked about it. And that is you can inactivate an enzyme by having a... Uh, allosteric inhibitor bind to the enzyme, and then you inactivate the enzyme. That is post-transcriptional control. We're not going to talk about it further, and you're not going to be tested on it. But we will talk about inducible operons, and this is a gene which is normally turned off. When the gene is needed, it is turned on. And if a gene is not needed, it doesn't make sense for the cell to make the gene products. Why bother making the gene product if you don't use them? They're not needed, and it only costs the cell energy to make the product, so it actually turns the gene off. And that's what an inducible 
operon does. And we'll give an example of an inducible operon. We're going to talk about the operon model of the gene expression. Bacterial operons are a region of the gene that encode for one or more structural genes. And a structural gene is normally what we're talking about when we talk about a gene. Like when we're talking about the gene encoding for the enzyme lactase, we're talking about a structural gene. When we're talking about the blue-eyed human gene, we're talking about a structural gene. And operon does include that structural gene. In prokaryotes, there may be more than one structural gene in the operon. But the operon also includes regions of DNA around the structural gene that control the expression of that structural gene. So an operon is, in a sense, a super gene, because this is one operon for actually the uh, lactose gene or the lactase gene, and Z is the lactase structural gene. And then the P and the O are controlling regions that control the expression of the lactase gene. Our eukaryotic operons are similar to bacterial operons with one exception, and it, that is a eukaryotic operon only contains one structural gene. Okay, so each eukaryotic operon only contains one structural gene. In a prokaryotic operon, they may contain one structural gene but they may contain more than one structural gene. In the case of the lactose operon, the Z gene codes for the enzyme lactase. The Y gene and the A gene are two structural genes in the LAC operon that are involved in the metabolism of the sugar lactose. And always the Structural genes in the operon are related genes, meaning in the case of the lact operon, all three of the genes are involved in the metabolism of the sugar lactose. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, I'm going to end it here. And I will see you. Do we have the lab today? Let me look. I forgot to look at that earlier. We do have a lab, lab nine. So I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab. All right. All right, bye.